uh, Emily and Teresa. Uh, you're no strangers to final debates, uh, so I w so do get out and I and I wish both of you uh, the good luck. And I'm looking forward to, to the debate and to see who is our new champion. So everyone, uh, let's let's do it. Now it's our, our decision is to Paul or is it Jess? Who's like the master of ceremonies here? <laughs> Should we send it to the chat to somebody? I, I don't know. Look, I, I'm not asking for it. I'm just asking who I send my ballot to. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'll run it. I mean, uh, let me just give you my phone. Thank, thank you, Chris. Yeah, no worries. Uh, okay, uh, girl. So we're at uh, Emily. You are pro. So uh, just show up your cards, girls, real quick. Well, I guess you made it this far. You're fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good for sure. For sure. Uh, okay, so we're going to go four minutes, uh, Emily, for your uh, affirmative constructive speech. Just let me know when you're pressing start. Is everyone ready? My time will be getting... Hold on, hold on. Uh, is is do you, is her audio a little iffy for you guys too? Yeah. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely now. <clears throat> okay. All right, good. And my time will begin now. A survivor of the Japanese Sino War. When Sung Shi recalled the hardship she endured, saying, One day, six or seven Japanese troops arrived, all of them armed with guns, knives hanging by their weight. They took six or seven maidens from the crowd of refugees. I was among those taken. To this day, she still can't bear telling her children, for though the war has ended, the pain she suffered lives on. This is the reality of war for an innocent civilian. Why risk this happening to your mother, your grandmother, your friend? Why risk threatening the safeties of foreign and American citizens alike? Why resort to war when there's a better, more peaceful option? My name is Emily Zhang, and I affirm the resolution that economic sanctions as a foreign policy tool does more good than harm. My supporting reasons are that economic sanctions combat human rights abuses and that they are a better option in contrast with the alternative, war. To my first point. Economic sanctions help combat human rights abuses. Let's take a look at the example of South Africa. The US implemented economic sanctions there to end apartheid, their system of racial-based discrimination. As Rachel Jones of the National Geographic wrote in 2019, towns were segregated and by the late 1950s, over 80% of South Africa's land was owned by whites and non-whites had to carry documents allowing them to enter restricted areas. Michael Pearson and Tom Cohen, CNN, wrote in 2013 that Ellen Marshall was just trying to go to church. A police officer shot her in the back on that November day in 1990. Debo Morsi, severely tortured and detained. So Yisil Douse, shot dead by policemen, families separated, races relocated. This was apartheid. The sanctions worked. FSNSS reports of these sanctions found that the American anti-apartheid movement had the greatest success with demanding an end to business ties with South Africa and a withdrawal of firms active in the country. Kids of all different races and ethnicities are now able to run free in South Africa, no longer fearing for their lives every time they step outside. No longer fearing for the big scary guy who could kill them for the colors of their skin for something they cannot change. Now to my second point. Economic sanctions are a safer and more peaceful option in contrast with the alternative, war. Violence is becoming increasingly prominent in the world we live in today to the point where we are indifferent to ongoing wars across the globe. Blood, death, despair, but even then nobody seems to care. We celebrate Memorials Day and Veterans Day, but we barely shed an eye to the soldiers who are dying serving our country, protecting each and every one of us. The State of the World's Children Report of 1996, UNICEF, found that between 1945 and 1992, there were 149 major wars, killing more than 23 million people. In fact, during the last decade alone, there have been 2 million children killed, 4 to 5 million disabled, 12 million left homeless, more than 1 million orphaned or separated from their parents, 
and some 10 million psychologically traumatized. Keep in mind that the numbers that I just listed are solely child victims and don't even consider the adults and military personnel who have been forever scarred emotionally, injured, or even killed as a result of war over just the last 10 years. What if you did know that survivor of the Japanese Sino War? What if you watched as she was stripped away from the group of refugees and couldn't do anything about it? And if not her, I think any war veteran or survivor can tell you just how horrid and violent war truly is. Judges, turn to the safer and more peaceful option. Protect fathers, sons, mothers, daughters across the globe and cast a pro ballot in today's debate. Thank you. Okay, let me set up my timer for two minutes for cross acts. Is everyone ready? Okay, cross sex will begin now. You call a quote unquote a peaceful option, is that correct? Yes. So is starving people and letting them die of malnutrition peaceful for the pro side? I'm sorry, could you phrase that question more directly? Yes, you stated that sanctions were peaceful. So are you saying that starvation and dying from starving is peaceful? I don't see how this relates because sanctions don't cause people to starve and die. Okay, so when you attack someone's economy and causes an inflation and increased food and water, will there be less food or more food? Though the food prices may go up, the countries will commonly implement free food rations and the U.S. will actually send over food, water, and other supplies to help relieve these sensibilities. Okay, so the pro role thinks sanctions are peaceful and that starvation does not occur at all. Okay, moving on to my next- I think that there will be some starvation, but it won't be nearly as bad as you're making it out to be. Okay, moving on to my next question about South Africa. You credit apartheid because of sanctions. Are you aware that political pressure ended apartheid? Actually, it's a mix of the both because when economic sanctions are implemented, they are seldom implemented alone. There's a lot of other political and diplomatic pressures that go with it so that it together can make changes in these countries. Do you have any evidence that directly correlates sanctions to the end of apartheid? Yes, several case studies, including that of FSNSFs, has said that apartheid led to the end of apartheid. Okay, moving on to my next question. You say that it's safer compared to war, but how likely is this hypothetical war you're talking about? Very likely, actually, because many countries are actually threatening war before we implement sanctions, and sanctions even ended a war in Yugoslavia. Okay, that's thank you. Setting up my four minute timer for my calling speech. Okay. Is everyone ready? Okay, my timer will begin now. Every day I see the same story. Ever since economic sanctions hit, medicine shortages are so common. I have a patient upstairs, and the cost of medication was so high and there was no medication left, that my only option was to just leave him there and let him die, says Dr. Barone's Amami, who's a doctor who works in hospitals in Iran. Even doctors are pointing out the medicine shortages and how people are suffering from inflation of the economy and lack of food, water, and medicine. Hi, George. My name is Teresa, and I strongly oppose the resolution that economic sanctions as a foreign policy tool does more good than harm. First, it harms the people not the leader in charge, and finally second, it only strengthens the regime. Now moving on to my very first point, it harms the people, not the leader in charge. This is because sanctions purposely target the economy and cause inflation, which causes food and water prices to skyrocket. This makes it extremely hard to afford and get food and water. This also includes medicine shortages. And according to the Humans Right Watch, economic sanctions cause a wrong quote unquote, unnecessary suffering. And on top of that, it posed a major threat to the right of health. New York Times in 2013 also reported that poverty went from 22% to 
to 40% because of economic sanctions. And a US library of medicine said in 2018, there was 300,000 deaths because of sanctions. And also Human Rights Watch in 2014 saw a 30% increase in hospital mortality. Sanctions are literally killing, literally, citizens and causing them to die of malnutrition. Now, moving on to my next example, Venezuela. According to Brookings Institute, United States sanctions killed 40,000 additional people. Additional meaning people that didn't have to die in the first place or to begin with. And in 2018, there was an 85% shortage of medication. 85% as impact sanctions lead to loss of life, death, and people not even getting the medicine that they deserve as human beings. Now moving on to my second and final contention, it only strengthens the regime. Now, why? A, it causes more dependence on a very corrupt government. According to Wall Street Journal in 2020, in a report, sanctions lead to increased dependence on a government because by depriving food and water and necessities, it only makes the citizens want the government more and depend on them more for survival. And according to Human Rights Watch in 2019, 60% of Iranians rely solely and only on the government for their survival. This allows the government to be more corrupt and actually increases corruptness and causes more strengthening. And B, it builds anti-American and West sentiment. One example of this is 9-11. One of the terrorists behind the attack, Osama bin Laden, wrote a letter called My Letter to America in 2002, stating sanctions as a reason why he committed a crime. 9-11 killed 2,900 77 victims, and every day we sit in silence to remember the people who have died from this attack. Sanctions only increase anti americanism and cause even more hate and terrorism. And according to Princeton University in 2015, sanctions provide a quote unquote breeding ground for terrorism to grow and helps terrorism organizations recruit activists and even more people. Judge, as you can see, sanctions cause more hate, terrorism, and more terrorist acts like 9 11 to occur and only cause starvation and people to be deprived of things necessary for survival. Things that you and me use every day, food, water, and medicine. These people suffering, they don't have it because sanctions target their economy and even cause hatred to occur. Judge, the choice couldn't be clear in today's debate. For sake of these people, cast out combat in today's debate. I now stand for cross-examination. Okay, two minute cross-examination of the negative constructive speech. Is everyone ready? Yes, I'm ready. My, my time will begin now. So you said that it caused Iranian people unnecessary suffering because of our economic sanctions. Is that correct? Yes, their economy was attacked and inflated. Okay, so was Iran threatening war before these sanctions were in place? I'm not sure why we're talking about war here because the resolution clearly states economic sanctions as a foreign policy tool. We're not here to discuss the harms of war here. Could you answer the question with a yes or no answer, please? Can you repeat that question? Was Iran threatening war before the economic sanctions were put in place? Threatening war against whom? Against us, the US. That was probably an exaggeration that Hussein was trying to say. I'm, not I'm sorry, sure. Saddam Hussein isn't the tyrant of Iran. Could you answer the question with a yes or no question? Answer, please. I'm not sure what you're trying to get out here because I think you're trying to say and talk about military intervention. But like I pointed out, we're not here to talk about military intervention. The resolution clearly states economic sanctions. Okay, thank you. And you also talked about how there is now more dependence on the government. And so the people are going to need them more. When a government like resign, when a government agent resigns, does someone else take their place? Yes, yeah, someone takes their place. When a person resigns, the position is refilled. So why does it matter if they are more dependent on this temporary govern governor or government agent if we are trying to get rid of these government agents? That's like saying the U.S. is temporary because we switch presidents every year, every four years. Just because we switch presidents and leaders doesn't mean that it's temporary. Okay, thank you.
Would you Can like I to use any prep time? Prep, please. One minute prep for the affirmative starting now. All right, I am ready. All righty. Three minute refu uh, affirmative refutation. My time will begin now. In this speech, I will be pointing out some flaws in my opponent's argumentation and hopefully explaining why her points do not stand. My opponent first claims that economic sanctions cause humanitarian disasters, but this is only true when they are incorrectly implemented. Firstly, it's important to note that we don't simply throw sanctions out and then allow the poor to fend for themselves. Thomas Bjergsen and Peter A.J. Van Bergic wrote that it is important to emphasize all that sanctions rarely, if ever, are implemented alone in, or in isolation from other foreign and security policy instruments. Active negotiations, peace mediation efforts, threats of force, peacekeeping operations, and or covert operations all coexist with the application of sanctions. Accordingly, sanctions should be evaluated from the standpoint of an integrated approach to international peace and security that takes into consideration other measures and looks at their interactive effects. Furthermore, when the terms are carefully outlined, it is made abundantly clear to countries what they must do in order to have these sanctions lifted. History shows that the success rate increases drastically when this is done, as oftentimes there can be some there can be some confusion or loopholes taking place if the terms aren't carefully outlined. Humanitarian disasters aren't an inherent flaw in the system of economic sanctions, but rather a consequence of their misuse. Next, my opponent claims that economic sanctions strengthen authoritarian regimes, saying that tyrants oftentimes blame the U.S. for any hardships they face, thus furthering the regime. The fact of the matter is, although economic sanctions are great for a multitude of purposes, they are not a one-step fix-all to every problem we may face in terms of international affairs. Durston Peckson of the University of Memphis wrote in his journal Defense and Peace Economics in 2019 that single-party and military regimes are less likely to concede to foreign pressure compared to democracies. This is because they effectively avoid co coercion using other resources. However, sanctions against personalist regimes, on the other hand, are more likely to be effective as sanctions directed at these kinds of governments can often be as effective as those targeted against democracies. If my opponent is talking about single party or military regimes, then she is absolutely correct. And that is exactly what she is talking about with people like Saddam Hussein. Next, it's, it needs to be made clear that although economic sanctions can't fix every situation that this hardly invalidates them as a foreign policy tool. In other situations, economic sanctions and wars, they lead to less racism in countries. Iran was threatening war, economic sanctions led to peace negotiations, economic sanctions ended the war in Yugoslavia, South Africa, apartheid came to end, and the list goes on. Further, several studies have shown that sanctions are likely to decrease government power in these terrible countries with terrible leaders by 44%. Thus, I affirm. Okay. Uh, okay, Teresa, you want to use any prep time, young lady? Yeah, I'll take 20 seconds prep. 20 seconds? All righty. <laughs> 20 seconds starting now. All right. Three minutes, um, a negative refutation. Okay, let me set my timer for three minutes. Okay. Is everyone ready? My time will begin now. My opponent's very first contention was that economic sanctions combat human rights abuses. However, they actually destroy human rights. Let me remind you about a 300,000 people dying and suffering in countries like Iran and that 30% increased mortality rate in 2014 because of sanctions and hospitals. And their sole example of how they're saving human rights is South Africa and apartheid. However, apartheid was mainly ended because of political pressure. And according to a study done by Harvard in the year of 2018, economic sanctions had little to no effect in ending apartheid. And political pressure and pressure of other countries to change was the reason why apartheid ended, not economic sanctions. So let me remind you, are the people dying of malnutrition and dying because they get, can't get food or water on the table because sanctions are targeting their own economy. Now, my opponent's second and final contention is that, look, economic sanctions are better and safer compared to war. 
and they give you this big statistic on how two million are dying in this big number. However, let me remind you that they're talking about a hypothetical war here. And let's weigh this against people dying right now, right this second. 40,000 additional deaths in Venezuela and 300,000 people dying in a row. On top of that, sanctions actually cause war. Let's look at an example of Iraq. Iraq was sanctioned and after that, a war happened, the Iraq war. That was eight years long and there's still a war going around in Iraq right now. My point telling about how soldiers are not disposable, soldiers shouldn't be suffering. Well, they're doing that because they're in a war caused by economic sanctions. Economic sanctions was, was started and war happened after that. So discard this contention completely. Josh, let me tell you about how people are suffering right now and how in a pro world, my, we, my, the pro world, my point is talking about hypothetical wars and wars are not gonna happen and saying that sanctions are a peaceful option. No, peaceful is not people starving and dying of malnutrition. Peaceful is not people not being able to get food on the tables and dying because they don't have proper nutrients. That's literally starving people and letting them die. That is not peaceful in the view of the common world. Judge, I want you to seriously consider how hate and terrorism is rising, how 9-11 was caused by sanctions, and on top of that, how people are starving and being harmed and strengthening the regime, the government is becoming more corrupt. Look at North Korea. We've been sanctioning them for 18 years, 18 years. And yet they're still continuing proliferation and they're still continuing abusing human rights, which my opponent says that they're not, but they still are. It's been 18 years, nothing's going on. People are starving and dying of malnutrition. Cast on combat in today's debate. None of my opponent's contentions stand. Thank you. Burn that last minute, right, Em? Yeah, go ahead. All right, all right. Okay, I'm ready. All righty. Two minute affirmative uh, closing speech. My time will begin now. When countries are ready to declare war, that is no longer hypothetical. When sanctions ended a war that was already happening in Yugoslavia, that is not hypothetical. But judges, even if you want to believe that these wars are hypothetical, you can thank economic sanctions for that. You can thank economic sanctions for them being hypothetical and not for the millions of deaths that would have happened had they not been there. Wen Sung Shi, Chen Jiaxiao, Mr. Chen, all kidnapped, open fired at, or watched as their aunts were stabbed to death because they refused to be raped. This is the reality of war. This is the alternative. Economic sanctions are used when diplomacy fails. 300,000 people may have died in Iran and every life lost is one too many, but Iran was threatening war prior to these sanctions and now they are not. Let us re look at the consequences of war. Two million children killed, four to five million disabled, 12 million left homeless, more than one million orphaned or separated from their parents, and some 10 million psychologically traumatized. 10 years. Hatred and violence run rampant in the world we live in today, and every military endeavor, every soldier killed, every innocent civilian traumatized further fuels that. This is our turn. This is our turn to protect all the military personnel, all the soldiers who are willing to die to protect our country. But they're not dispensable. We shouldn't allow them to simply die when there is a better option, when there's the more peaceful option. Economic sanctions are the one thing standing between life and death peace and war. Judges, join me in protecting foreign and American citizens alike, fathers, brothers, mothers, sisters, children, those children who will be left dead or traumatized and cast a pro ballot in today's debate. Thank you. All right, Teresa Fong, you have a minute and 40. Yep. All right, starting now. All right. Two minute uh, negative closing speech. Okay, let me just set my two minute timer. Okay. Is everyone ready? 
Okay, my time will begin now. Poverty from 22% to an all time high of 40%. 300,000 people dying in Iran that did not need to die in the first place. 40,000 additional Venezuelans that didn't have to die, but died of malnutrition and lack of food and water. Things ne necessary for humans to literally survive. This is human rate abuse and 30% increased hospital mortality rate. I vote for pro side as I vote for all of that. Hi, Judge. I have won today's debate because I went on impact and I went because of my first contention. Harms the people not the leader. When we have economic sanctions that target another's economy for the sole purpose to put pressure, what happens is that food and water prices go up, inflation occurs, shortages occur, and people suffer. That doctor I told you about, he has to constantly tell his patients, there's nothing I can do except for let me die because I don't have the medicine to help you. That is what's going on. And let's look at today's resolution. Economic sanctions does more good than harm. So let's see if my opponent is actually fulfilling the resolution. The answer is no. Look at the harms. Murderous sanctions, decreasing food and water, increased prices, increased hate and sentiment against the West, a strengthened regime, more corruptness. This is only leading to more harm. And they try to weigh this with the good by saying, oh, look, war is worse. At least we're being peaceful and war is way worse. Peaceful is not letting people starve. Peaceful is not letting malnutrition and people dying and letting doctors tell patients there's nothing we can do. Peaceful. And they're using evidence by combining numbers from World War I and World War II together to give you this big, horrible number. But let me tell you right now that that is not, don't let that distract you from what's going on right now. The actual people suffering because economic sanctions are targeting their economy. War is actually caused by sanctions as well. Remember the Iraq War were because of sanctions and the war was also happened after. Judge passed our combat today's debate. My opponent has not fulfilled a resolution. Thank you. <laughs>